Welcome back, Casabang's crew. We are about to watch the last video lesson for Unit 1. Today, we are going to discuss what psychologists do with all of that fantastic data that they have gotten from their experiments or their correlational studies. This is where we are going to bring some math into psychology. And I heard a collective groan when I said math. Oh my gosh, Ms. Casabang, why do we have to learn math and social studies? Just this tiny little bit, it won't be that bad, I promise you, and you will never have to do any actual difficult computations on the exam or anything like that. Any math that you would have to do would be really super simple math. Um, but statistics and what psychologists do with the data is a really important part of learning about the science of psychology. So let's take a look get started. All right, so statistical reasoning in everyday life. So there are two different types of statistics that psychologists use to look at their data. The first type are called descriptive statistics. It is exactly what it sounds like. These are statistics that we use to describe the data that we have gotten. Underneath descriptive statistics, there's two different types. We have measures of central tendency that just summarize our data. And these are things that you have probably already heard of. I know you guys know what means are. These are the averages, the average of our data set. So mean, median, and mode. And then the second type of descriptive statistic are the measures of variability. So how much does our data vary? So here we're going to talk about range and standard deviation. And then the second type of statistics that researchers use are inferential statistics. And there's a couple of different types here that we're going to learn about as well. Statistical significance and the t-test. So describing our data, measures of central tendency. Um, so we have mode, which is the most frequently occurring number. We have mean, which is our mathematical average. And then we have median, which is our middle score, the score that falls directly in the middle of all of our data points. So there's this nice graphic here on the screen that shows you um, our mean, our median, and our mode. Okay, so on this, in this graphic, our mean is 140, so that is our mathematical average. Our median is 60, so that's the number right in the middle. And then our mode, which is the most occur frequently occurring number, is 40. And you can see that because you see uh, all the numbers of um, little men that are on each other's backs there. Um, that picture was what was called a, a frequency distribution. So when we're graphically representing our data, we are going to use frequency distributions when we're talking about mean, median, and mode most often. So a table or a chart um, that shows how the different numbers appear in the particular set of scores. So there's two different types that we see most often. We see a histogram, uh, also known as a bar graph. And then we see a polygon, which is a line graph. And I have a couple of pictures of each of these for you. So these would all be considered frequency distributions. So on the left-hand side, we have the number of M&Ms in a bag. That is a histogram or a bar graph. And then the average daily temperatures and the frequency polygon are ideas of uh, line graphs or polygons. Um, measures of variability. We're still under the descriptive statistics, okay? Still talking about describing statistics. We have measures of variability. Range. This is simply the largest number minus the smallest number. What is my range? So if I have a data set that my smallest number is 10, and my largest number is 100, I'm just going to subtract those and I'm going to say my range of scores is 90. Okay, range is really, really easy. And that might be one of those mathematical computations that they ask you to do on the exam because you could do that in your head. And then standard deviation. 
standard deviation is represented by this uh, equation that you see here on the bottom. You will never need to use this equation. I'm going to repeat myself. You will never need to figure out a standard deviation on the AP exam or any tests that I give you. I am only giving you this equation just to give you an idea on what it is. You do have to know and understand standard deviation. You have to understand what it is. And standard deviation is just taking a look and seeing how much your score or your data point varies from the mean of that group of data. Okay, so you just have to understand what standard deviation is. Standard deviation is oftentimes represented in a normal curve. And again, this might be review for some of you, but not all of you. So a normal curve is sometimes referred to as a bell curve. And this is just where scores from a particular data set are very symmetrically distributed around the mean of our data set. In order for it to be called a normal curve, for it to have that name, normal curve, the mean, the median, and the mode all have to be located at the very same data point. And I'm going to give you an example here. Okay, here is an example of the normal bell curve. Okay, this happens to be a bell curve from an intelligence test. But the center line where you see the figure of 100, that 100 is the mean, the median, and the mode of our data set. And that's what gives it that nice bell shape to it. So I want you to look at the value 100. And then notice that I have 85 on one side of it and I have 115 on the other side of it. These numerical values are standard deviations. These are the already computed standard deviations for this particular set of data. So in your notes, I want you to write SD, standard deviation, equals 15. Okay, so for this particular set of data, our standard deviation equals 15. So our mean is at 100. We're always going to start at our mean, and we're going to add 15 to get the next score, 115. We're going to add another 15 to get to 130, and another 15 to get to 145. You should be following along the bottom of this graph. Then we're going to go back to 100, and we're going to do the opposite. We're going to subtract 15, and we get our first standard deviation at 85, subtract another 15, we go down to 70, subtract another 15, we go down to 55. So the, that is showing you the numerical value of each of these standard deviations. This bell curve is also showing you some absolute exacts. In order for data to be on a bell curve, these values, these percentage values, must always stay the same. So let's look at the first one. It says 68% and it's that first box. It says 68% of people score within 15 points above or below 100%. So no matter if your normal curve is showing intelligence scores like it is here, or if your normal curve is showing uh, test scores in a college psychology classroom, Right, that 68% is going to hold steady. In order for it to be considered a normal curve, it has to have 68% of the respondents one standard deviation above or one standard deviation below the mean. You have to remember these numbers. And other than just memorizing it, I, I don't know how else to tell you that you to, to make it easy on you. You have to remember these numbers. We will refer to this again and again and again. Now, look at the 95%. And you notice the 95% is encompassing two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above. So 95% of our data points 
are going to fall within two standard deviations of our mean. Again, this is a requirement of a bell curve. And then we have the smallest amounts, 2% on either side for three standard deviations above our mean, and then the smallest, tiniest little tenth of a percent on either side for above and below. Those are the severe outliers, very, very, very small numbers. We will work with the bell curve a little bit more in class because I know not everyone has had experience here with the bell curve, but you do need to remember these values, so get to memorizing it. Okay, what happens if our mean, median, and mode are not all on the same point? So look at that graph in the middle. Okay, mean, median, and mode all at the same point gives it that nice bell curve, okay? But if they are not, at the same point, then we get what's called a skewed distribution or a skewed curve. So on uh, letter A, right, on the far left-hand side, we have a negatively skewed curve. Right? This is because our mean falls over to the far left. Right? Our mean is over to the far left. And then if you look at the curve on the far right-hand side, letter C, that is a positively skewed curve. And again, this is because our mean is to the far right of the data set. All right, so inferential statistics, the se second type of statistics that psychologists use. This allows psychologists to compare their data to other data sets for similar types of experiments. So the first set, descriptive statistics, we're only talking about my data as the researcher. Inferential statistics, we now want to compare my data to other data sets. And we want to make sure that my data is happening because variable A is causing variable B. We don't, we want to make sure that that is true. We want to make sure that there is no doubt and there is the variable B isn't being caused by some other variable that we haven't even really thought of. So inferential statistics allows us to generalize our results to the general population. So if it shows that yes, our hypothesis is correct and yes, our data is correct without, you know, a, much of a doubt, then we can say that our experiment generalizes to the population. Um, when is an observed difference reliable? Okay, we want to see a difference. Okay, we want to say that variable A caused variable B. So these are just a couple of things that we kind of talked about in the experimentation phase as well, but it comes up again here with inferential statistics. So representative samples are better than biased samples. We already talked about that. We want a sample that's representative of the population that we're trying to study. Um, less variable observations are more reliable than observations that are more variable. So think about this. We want to see the same behaviors. That is less variable. Right? We want to see the same behaviors. And then more cases are better than fewer. Of course, we would, if we can do an experiment with 1,000 or 10,000 people, that's going to be better than 1 or 10. Right? So we want more cases. Um, statistical significance. Okay? This is where our t-test comes into play. So we're looking at two means. We're going to look at the mean of my data and the mean of your data. And we're going to compare them to see if they are significantly different. And remember, we're, we're hoping they're not different, okay? We don't want them to be different because if they're the same or if they're close to the same, then that means that our hypothesis is really strong. We are really, in fact, saying variable A causes variable B, okay? So, that is uh, a numerical value. It's called a p-value, 
Okay, so P equals, and we want it to be less than 0.05. So the P stands for probability. Okay, so the probability that our results were due to chance is less than 5%. So what that's saying on the flip side, 95% sure my results are because variable A caused variable B. And that's just the threshold, okay? It can be as long as it's our p-value is less than 0.05, okay? Here's just a couple little memes to help you sort of remember that p-value, okay? So there, there's Dawson from Dawson's Creek, if you've seen it, okay? Looking sad, and we've got like an angry face here when our p-value is over 5%. Okay, we don't want it over. We want it less than. Um, in your uh, video notes, I would like for you to draw a Venn diagram and compare and contrast descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. What is it? What mathematical equations do you use in each of them? Okay, and I do want you to remember descriptive statistics, we are describing our data. Inferential statistics, take the first five letters, infer. Okay, we're trying to infer from our data whether it's good. Okay, is this good data? Does this data prove our hypothesis? Okay, so we are done with today's video and this is our last video for unit one as well. I want to remind you Write down any questions or concerns that you have. If you've not taken AP Stat or a statistics course, this might be a little bit difficult for you. So please make sure you write down any questions that you have so we can go over them in class and make sure that you complete your video notes. So when it comes time in class to play with some data sets, you have the background that you need. I hope you guys have a fantastic day. See you later.